morning, good morning. Let's all stand. It's so nice to have some people back here today. Um, we're, for those of you that are still home, we're going to be doing Psalms 95 for our scripture. And I just wanted to encourage you to think about the words that you're saying because, you know, we're all empty by the end of our week. We've all went through a lot of things and challenges, and today is a day to be filled back up. So that's what I want you to think about today. So Psalms 95, O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. In his hands are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice. Father, we just come to you today, and we thank you, Lord, that as we come to you and all of the life challenges that we have, God, we can come before you and we can ask to be filled with your presence, to be filled with your love, to be filled with your grace. So God, as we raise a hallelujah today, we're going to raise a hallelujah in the situations that we face. We're going to raise a hallelujah for our health. We're going to raise a hallelujah for anything that we need today because you have power and we need it. So Father, we thank you for who you are and we give you all the praise today in Jesus' name. Amen.
set in our hearts, Father, for you, for everything about you. God, whenever we're going through something and we don't understand it, we need to draw from your strength, draw from your power. So, Father, set a fire in our hearts that burns after you, the things of you, the things that we need from you, God. Set a fire. I can't 
just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. And I just want you I'm caught up in your presence I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this voice
our homes, in our schools, in our nation, God, set a fire, Lord, in our hearts, God, in our children, Lord, only for you, Jesus, only for you. God, we give you this day. We give you this service. God, we so need a touch from you that we've never experienced before. Something that when we look in your face, God, there's a change in our hearts. There's a change in our demeanor. There's a change in our attitude, God. God, you're a God of love. And we need to remember that. You're not a God of, of um, judgment. You're not a God that causes us not to want to serve you, but you're a God of love. And we need to have love for your people. Thank you, God, for putting a fire in our hearts to serve you, to honor you, and to become more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. All right, so if you're with Miss Etika, you can go. Etika's like thrilled to see, so. All right. Uh, now, if you are nursery, nursery age, you can go. And then we will go with Miss Heather. So if you're with Miss Heather. Hello, hello, hello. All right, and then five. That was easy. I got 21. 21, 21. All right. A couple of things, a couple of announcements, maybe. Um, things that we have coming up. You guys have your bulletins. You got those. So um, on Tuesday evening, on Tuesday evening, uh, we're going to start back up our strengthening your mental health classes. So we're starting this brand new, okay? So this is a new group starting up. The guys that have been through it uh, once already are going to set in on it uh, to kind of to help you through. So if you would like more information on that, this is based off of the scripture of renewing your mind. Um, a gentleman uh, here in, in the area, his name's Randy Landis, wrote a book called Freighter's Thicket, Renewing the Mind. And this really walks us through that process of how to take captive every vain imagination. You know, the scripture is real clear about taking that captive and, and getting those thoughts under subjection. And it walks through and teaches us how to do that. And then again, on Wednesday nights, 
is our Bible study uh, that we have. And right now we are studying the nine spiritual disciplines. And we're dealing with what it is to really live a Christian life. You know, coming to church on Sundays is just a very small portion of uh, what we're supposed to be doing. And then I'll be getting back with you on the men's ministry and the women's ministry when those kick back off and we're back at the in-person services. Amen? I think that's all of the uh, formal stuff we've got to do. Amen. It's good. Man, it is good to see you. How you doing, my friend? Good to see you. So lots and lots and lots of exciting and good things going on. But I would like to talk to you today about the subject. And man, that last song we sang is so fitting. I want to talk to you about first love. Our first love. You know, I've been around this thing for 52 years, long time. I like to tell people I was born on Friday and I was on the organ bench on Sunday. And that's pretty close to the truth. Um, I didn't, I don't, I could probably count on one hand the number of services that I've missed in my entire life. My mama was like, if you're sick, you can be sick under the pew as good as you can be sick at home. So we would bring a pillow and a blanket and we would lay underneath the pew and that's where we were raised. And my mom could correct you with her eyeballs from the organ bench. It was worse than the beating you were going to get when you got home. Uh, but the whole process was being around it for so long, it's so easy to become so accustomed to things that it loses its life. And the challenge that I've had this late in my life is to return back to the first love when I first personally fell in love with God. The excitement that I had. I mean, I would, I would witness to a tree, man. It didn't matter. It was like, you're, I, I've got to share this thing. It's burning inside of me. And when I looked, I was like, God, is this only me? Is this the stuff that I go through? And uh, I was really encouraged to find in the Bible that I wasn't the only one. So let's go over to Revelations chapter 2. I scared my daughter to death when I told her I was preaching out of Revelations today. She went, oh, no, what's he going to do to us? Revelations chapter 2, starting in verse 1. We're dealing with uh, the church of Ephesus here. And it says, to the angels of the church of Ephesus write, these things, says he, who holds the seven stars in his right hand, he who walks the midst of the seven golden lampstands. And here's where we start. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. Hmm. You have preserved you have patience, you have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. So this, we're talking about people that are, are men and women of God, who have been about the business of God, who have been faithful to God, who are doing all the right stuff. They are ministering, they are, they are uh, setting up the principles of God, the apostolic covering of God, they're doing all that. But verse 4 says, nevertheless, I have this against you. He said, I got a problem with you. Here's the problem. You have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works. Or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from the place. Unless you repent. But this you have, but this you have that you hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I do hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Amen. Father God, add your blessing to your word today. Give us wisdom as we walk through this scripture, Father, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. This, to me, is a picture of where the body of Christ is today. 
There are so many churches and so many ministries, so many guys like in my position where we've been so busy about the work of God. We've been doing good stuff. Man, I can look all around the region. I see good stuff going on. But I believe that in this season, God's saying to us, I've got an issue with you, son. What you do for me has become more important than me. And I went, ow, that hurt. You've been so busy doing things for me that you're not spending any time with me. You've become so busy pleasing me and trying to please me that you're not doing the simple thing that I created you for, which was to spend time with me. If you love me, all the other love that you need for everyone else will take care of itself. Because here's what happens. When we are aligned correctly vertically, the horizontal God will take care of. How do we see that? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all the things will be added. That is here, and then he'll take care of here. But we get so wrapped up in the, the busyness of God. I heard a preacher say the other day, with the pandemic and the time of being away from the church, we should have a stronger relationship with God now because we haven't had anything to be busy with. Because if you've been around church any time at all, you realize that it's real easy to get busy in church. You know, there's a lot that goes on. Things don't just happen. You know, with worship teams, there's practices. You know, there's the cleaning of the church. There's ministries that are going on. There's something going on just about every day. And it's real easy to get wrapped up in the busyness of the church. When God says, the only thing I really want from you is you. I just want your love. I want you to put me in a place where I am absolutely, positively first. The way that we forsake our first love is when we put our stuff above him or when we put what we do. The Pharisees and the Sadducees of the, of the New Testament were people that followed the principles of God, but he said they were evil. He said, you look good on the outside, but inside you're rotten. You're busy about all the stuff, but you haven't let me do that inner working inside of you that I have desired to do. We have faith. But here's the thing about faith. Faith gives you the ability to obey the law. Love fulfills it. Now let me, let, let, let's get this principle because when I read this the first time, I was like, that doesn't make sense to me. Faith gives me the ability to obey the law. Faith is doing what God says to do. But didn't Jesus say, I didn't come to do away with the law, but I came to fulfill the law. So the law is still there. The faith gives me the ability to say, God will do what he says he does if I will obey the law, if I will obey what God's word tells me to do, if I'll get back to the basics of the word of God. But here's what love does. Love says, I will fulfill every portion of the law. I will fulfill the discipline when you mess up. I will fulfill the blessing as you succeed. But here's the one thing I know about love. True love does what it does, not expecting anything in return. So the question I asked myself sitting in my office yesterday was this. How would I love God if I knew there was not going to be a tomorrow? How would I love God? How would I seek after him not knowing or knowing that there would be no tomorrow? Because so many times I find myself in my life being guilty of this. God, I love you. I seek you because I know I'll have a return on what I do. I know that if I love you, you promise me you'll do this. I know that if I love you, but if there's no tomorrow, am I going to love him with everything that's in me, realizing that there's no return on anything I give him? Am I still going to love him? 
You guys remember I told you a song mother used to sing all the time, if I never again see a miracle divine, my faith will remain that God is just the same. And I love you. But what would our level of love be for God if we knew that he had done everything for us that he was going to do? Would we still love him? Would we still worship him? Would we still pour ourselves out in front of him? Is it just enough to spend time with him? You know, so many times in premarital counseling, I'll talk to these people that are getting ready to get married, and I'll say this. Can you spend 10 hours together, enjoy yourself, and never touch each other? If you can, you're in love. If you can't, you're in heat. (laughs) Because if you spend that kind of time together, you're best friends. Do I spend time in the presence of God just because I love him and I want to be there? Or is my motive behind it what he's going to give me? We, we've, we've made this, a the Christian walk, a um, name it, claim it, bag it, tag it thing instead of a relationship thing. We've made it that the prosperity message, and trust me, I believe in prosperity. i got no problem with it. I believe in faith. I believe in healing. I believe in the, in the blessings of God with all of my heart. I believe it. I've seen it in my life over and over and over and over again. But man, do I love my God. Just to be able to be in his presence, to breathe in the full presence of God. That last song we sang, I don't think the words are here. Can you guys bring those words up to the last song we sang, please? To be in the presence of God, to realize that all that I am, all that I, the very breath that I breathe is a gift from him. That I love him at a completely different level. Yep, next page. No place that I would rather be than here in your love. I can't think of anything that I would rather be doing. That's a big statement. And we we sang this this morning. We got to be careful what we proclaim because some of us were singing, singing this thinking about what we were doing this afternoon. We have all these things because, trust me, you know, at being a school teacher, uh, my well, there's a lot of my life right now that is eaten up with how we're going to go back. Thinking about how we're going to sanitize my room, how I'm going to sanitize the lab, how I'm going to do all these things. And I get so eaten up with all this stuff. And then at the end of the day, I turn around and said, wow, I didn't spend any time. <sighs> but God, there's no place I would rather be. Go to the next one. Then here in your love. And it talks about setting this fire that's inside of me, this, this, the fire that was there at one time. Lord, I'm caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment, and I never want to leave. This is God's desire for us. And he's just waiting on us to reciprocate that desire. God is not too busy for you. He wants to spend time with you. It's the whole purpose he created you was for you to worship, for you to sit at his feet, for you to love him like there's no tomorrow. For that love to come from a place that says, God, I love you for who you are, not for what you can do. I love you for who you are, not what you're going to do for me. So Jesus kind of set this up in a couple places for us to show us what it means to love him. John chapter 14. Thank you, George, for bringing that up. John chapter 14, verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. 
Remember, we talked about faith and love. We're keeping his commandments. And then he says, listen, when you do that, I will pray the Father that he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. And the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because he neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him and he dwells with you and will be in you. And I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. All based off of you love me. I will completely saturate every portion of your life. I will send to you the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit will do deep intercessions in you. That Holy Spirit will reveal to you things in my will in your life. That Holy Spirit will give you a power that the world knows nothing about. That Holy Spirit will comfort you in the dark times, will celebrate you in the good times, will carry you in the bad times. And it's all because you love me. Just because you love me. Keep my commandments. Matthew chapter 22, verse 36. Young Pharisee looks at Jesus and says, Teacher, what's the greatest commandment in the law? You guys have heard this so many times. And Jesus answered him and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 40, and on, on these two commandments hang all, how much of it? All the law and the prophets. So here's the thing, friend. We spend so much time trying to figure out the duty laws. Do this, do this, you know, Deuteronomy stuff, right? Do this, do this, do this, do this. And God says, listen, all the laws are based on two things. Love me, love your neighbor. How? With everything in you. Because if you stop and look at every other law, every other commandment that God's given, if you love God with all, the, uh, all that's in you, and you love your neighbor, everything else falls into line. Because all other sins are rooted in selfishness. And the only thing that's rooted in these first two commandments is don't be selfish. Put me first, put others before you. Now, all of a sudden, we just simplified things. Instead of going after and trying to do all the stuff and get wrapped up in all the stuff and be so busy, God says, simple, love me. How much? With everything. That's the thing about this Christian walk. It will cost you absolutely everything. It will. And man, is it worth it. Man, is it worth it. Because when God loves, he loves hard. He loves every area of your life, wants to be involved in everything that you are, everything that you have. He wants to be that blessing to it. He wants to expose you to so many things. The only thing he wants from you is love. Because when you love him, you're obedient. How much easier would this walk be, Ben, if we just did what God asked us to do instead of trying to do everything else? Easier. Much easier. But see, we get so wrapped up in all the stuff. You know, during the time that God wasn't speaking between the Old Testament and New Testament, over 400 laws were added. So that tells me when we're not listening to God and we're not hearing the voice of God, we make things hard. We add stuff that doesn't need to be added. Seek first the kingdom. Love me. Put me before everything else. And I'll tell you what to do. If we get scriptural about it, I will direct your path. I'll tell you what steps to take, when to take them, how to take them, what direction to go. And then you're not beating yourself to death trying to do everything. There's so much time in my life 
where I was so busy trying to please God with activity. Man, I was doing everything. Everything. I was so busy that I had no time for God. God says, hey, man, I'd love to talk to you for just a minute. God, I'm busy doing your stuff. But the word tells us that on that day of judgment, there's going to be those that stand in front of him that say, listen, I was busy. I did a lot of stuff in your name. I prophesied. I cast out demons. Man, I was the church, Doc. I was doing some stuff. And God looks at him and said, listen, I didn't know you. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. So that tells me busy is not the answer. Knowing God is. That word know there is the same connotation that we get from consummating a marriage. Having intimate knowledge of. Having a love relationship with. That's the level God wants to know you. Then he looks at you and says, enter into the rest of the Lord. To love God with all that's in me. John chapter 21. This is a passage where Peter was going through a dark night of the soul. He'd lost his identity. Forgot who he was. He went back to fishing. He had denied Jesus three times, even cussed at a little girl. Bad day. All of this stuff going on in his life, he really messed up. So Jesus decides to talk to him, and he says this, starting in verse 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, I always like when Jesus feeds us first. Thank you, Jesus. He said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Lord, yes. You know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. And he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Now, Peter was grieved. I, you know, it's funny how scriptures work. You know me, I'd go, Peter got ticked off. All right? He was not happy about this. He was grieved, and he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he answered, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. For assuredly, I say unto you, when you were younger, <laughs> you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hand for another to guide and to carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying that with death he would be glorifying God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Two areas that hit here. Love me. Do you love me? Do what I asked you to do. Do you love me? Three times, upsetting. He was like, this is getting old. This is getting old. And then finally, Jesus wrapped up with this and says, really, if you fully love me, I just need you to follow me. Just do what I have done. Imitate what I'm doing. Follow me in everything that I do and say. How many times in our life are we doing so many things that Jesus never asked us to do? This is a, the, the kind of the way it goes. We'll go to a pastor seminar, right, a church growth seminar, and we get all these great ideas, and all the churches that were there come back and try to implement every single idea and never say, God, should we have a food pantry? But it's the thing to do to make the church grow so everybody's going to have one. 
And then we're upset because we put all this work in, we did all this stuff, and nobody ever comes to our food pantry. And never one time do we stop and ask God if we should have that. When God doesn't maybe necessarily want you to have a food pantry, but would rather you have a ministry that reaches widows and orphans. The big push for the longest time was to have uh, a Celebrate Recovery. Love Celebrate Recovery, got nothing against it. God didn't tell us to have one. So what do we do? We plug them into the people that God did tell them to have. We don't have to do what's GQ to grow a church. We just have to be obedient to what God's asked us to do. In your life, there's no reason for you to try to do everything you see. You read a book and you're like, oh, I got to do that, and you jump into it. What would happen if you instead you would go to the presence of God and say, God, what do you, would you like me to do? What, what place do I fit? Because the Bible says that we are like living stones, fitly joined together. Every joint supplies. So what happens if your foot decides to be your ear? It's not doing its job. You're not going to walk real good, and you're definitely not going to hear. Some of us try to replace our teeth with our foot because we put our foot in our mouth so much. But what would happen if God calls you to be that that's what you do? Just because I love you, God. Because what happens is we feel that we're called to ministry. Everybody use that, use that big word, this ministry. Or what's your destiny in life? And we go after all this stuff and, and, and we get so wrapped up in it that we try to imitate and be somebody else instead of what God called you, called you to be. I had to hit a point in my life where I realized that I was always going to teach and preach like Doug does and be okay with that. I had to be okay with it. When I was working on my saxophones and I would work play, I would listen to certain people and I would try to sound like they did. And no matter what I do, it's Doug. And now when I play my horns, those that have heard me play for a long time know that it's me just because I'm playing it. Because it, it, it's something that comes out of me. It's who I am. Instead of trying to be the next whoever. Just be you. Because you supply what the body of Christ needs where you are. Instead of trying to jump up and be all this and fulfill all this and do all this, just do what God asked you to do. It's that simple. And you do it because you love him. Not to get your name in lights. It's expensive to put your name in lights. It's not worth it. Don't do it to seek recognition. Because if men pat you on the back, God says, well, that's good enough. I would rather God pat me on the back. Spending that time and loving him and presenting to him who I am, which is my worship, which the word of God says is your reasonable service. It's just reasonable. So that means if it's reasonable, that means it's not hard. It doesn't require an overabundance of effort. It just requires me to be. Remember when we talked about praise and worship and we said, if we don't worship the rocks and stones will cry out? How does a stone and a rock worship God? Is it going to grow a mouth real quick and start saying, hallelujah? No, it's just going to be a rock. And it's going to sit there and be the absolute best rock it can be. And it's going to worship God being glad it's a rock. Some of us are a little rock too, but we won't go there right now. And it, it, get, let's get that. Grab a hold of this. You just have to be you. Loving God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. Be a rock. Just be you. Loving God to this level that just says, God, I will be what you created me to be. 
I'm never going to preach like this one. I'm never going to sing like this one. I'm never going to play like this one. Doesn't matter. You created me to be me. So I'm going to love you with everything that I have. You guys remember the Christmas carol, Little Drummer Boy? I, I'm not a big Christmas carol guy, but I listen to that one and I cry. Because I was that little boy. A little boy that really didn't have anything that I thought was worthy to give God. I'm Doug from Clarksburg. I'm messed up. I grew up in a single parent home. We had a lot of times pray groceries in. I, what do I have? I don't have anything. Just like that little drummer boy saying, I don't have anything worthy to present to God. But then it realized, I can play. So he picked up his little drum and his sticks and he played. And he played. And that gift to me was more pleasing to God than all the frankincense and myrrh and gold on the face of the earth because he played. The gift that God has deposited in you is worth more than anything that you can contrive or make happen. You are enough for God. I want you to catch this. You are enough for God. But God, I'm broken. He likes broken toys because he gets to fix them. He's not going to discard you. But you don't understand, I have anger issues. It's okay. I'll teach you to be angry and not sin. But you don't understand, I, I, don't, I don't speak well. That's okay. I'll give you a mouthpiece. There's not an excuse that God can't fix. All he needs is you to say, God, here I am. Here I am. All I can do for you is play the drums. Might not be that good, but I can beat on them. He even fixed us those ones that can't sing. He said, just make a joyful noise. We can do that. I know people can't carry a tune in a bucket if you strap it and put a lid on it. Doesn't excuse you. You make a joyful noise. So who did God create you to be? Who are you? Who are you? This is the hard question for so many people. Because we're so messed up in our thinking, we've believed all of these things that people have said about us for all these years, but we don't go back and look at what God said. God said, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. You were created in the very image of God. This is scary because we're looking at God so many times and saying, God, you're not worth much if I was created in your image. And we have such a low opinion of ourselves that we can't present it to God anymore. The enemy wants to keep you downtrodden mentally about yourself so you don't see your worth in the eyes of God. You were worth the word, Jesus, leaving heaven. He had a good gig going on. Leaving heaven, coming to earth and becoming a man. 100% man, 100% God. To give us the ability to come back into the presence of God again. To give us a choice back. This is how much Jesus loved Father God. 
The Spirit of God leads him into the wilderness, drives him into the wilderness for a 40-day fast. Now, that's enough, all right? We talked about the fasting thing on Wednesday nights. I don't recommend you try a 40-day fast unless God says do it. Bad idea, all right? So Jesus goes for 40-day fast. The enemy never attacks you when you're at your strongest. He always wants to attack you when you're the weakest. So there were in the in the in tradition there were three fasts that they did in the Jewish tradition. There was a three day, there was a seven day, and there was a forty day. All right. So here's Satan sitting there. Jesus is on day eight. He went, ooh, he's going for the big one. Why didn't Satan come on day twenty? He could still be weaker. So he waits till day forty. And he shows up to the man Jesus. You guys know the story. Jesus goes through and it is written, it is written, it is written. And then the word says, the angels of the Lord came and ministered to, to Jesus. Now let's step into that for a minute, all right? I'm going to go into the book of Doug for a minute, okay? So this is not in the Bible. This is just me, okay? So get that clear. Don't message me that I'm preaching something crazy. This is just me, okay? I like to think on how the conversation might have gone. So they're bringing lunch to Jesus, these angels, right? He just spent 40 days fasting. All right, he's been in a desert, so he needed to clean up a little bit. So they're feeding him, and he's sitting there, and he looks at the angels and said, guys, did you see that? Well, yeah, we saw it. You know, 40-day fast, woo-hoo. He said, no, did you see what I just did to the devil as the devil's going up over the... Well, yeah, you, you beat him. He said, I beat him as a man of the word. I didn't beat him as God. I beat him as a man that loves God. And man, when that hit me, I went, look out. Because the man Jesus taught me how to be the man of God that'll beat anything the enemy throws at me because Jesus knew who he was. 30 years, 30 years of being a man. And he remembered who he was as a man of God. And the example that he was showing when he looked at Peter and he said, follow me, Think of everything that he was saying to Peter. He said, Peter, remember when I was led into the wilderness and the enemy attacked me, follow me. What did I do? Well, you beat him with the word. When my close friend died and everybody around me is falling apart and I cried, what did you, what did I, you were obedient to the word of God when God said. And you told us so many times that anything that you do, you don't do it unless first you see the father. Do it. He was teaching us what the level of love relationship we have to do and be with the father. What would have happened if Jesus went rogue and just healed everything? And just tried to raise everything from the dead. And just tried to fix it all. The man Jesus understood obedience and he understood love. And he only did what God asked him to do. Man, that's so freeing to me. I don't have to be all things to all people. Thank you, Jesus. I don't have to have all nine gifts of the Spirit gripping from my fingertips. Thank you, Jesus. I just have to be Doug. That's all. Because the gifts that I'm missing, he'll bring into my life. He'll bring people around me that are needed to complete the body of Christ. He'll put those teams in place. He'll put people in your life. I've got people in my life now that I know when I'm struggling in an area, 
they won't be, and I can call them and say, help. So the question is, are you ready to return to your first love? Now, this is a dangerous, dangerous word to preach as a pastor. Because now when I call for volunteers, everybody's like, God didn't tell me. Please listen. (laughs) But the truth is, you don't have to do everything. You don't have to do everything. If you're too busy for God, you're too busy. Now, notice I didn't say if you're too busy to do God's stuff. I'm, I'm not talking about doing. I'm not talking about here. If you're too busy for this, you're too busy. Loving. Loving with everything that's in you. Seek him first, and the stuff will take care of itself. He will guide and direct your steps. He will make that path straight. He'll make it so clear that you don't have to slow down. You can just go. But what's it cost you? It costs you a personal relationship with God. Personal relationship with God. So next week, we're going to talk about how that affects your world. If you do this, how's it going to affect your world? Why are we in the condition we're in right now? I'm going to be real careful not to preach next week's sermon. It's very clear why we are where we are. That's next week, so be here. This week, just love him. Just love him. Take some time just to breathe. God, there's nothing more important to me than just to sit at your feet. So I'm going to shut everything off. I'm going to turn off all the technology. I'm going to turn off every piece of of interruption. The kids are napping. I'm going to close my door. I'm going to turn the light off, and I'm just going to breathe. See what happens. Just see what happens. Loving. That needs to be our focus this week. So, Rob, we're going back to act. It's been a while since I did this one. At the end of every sermon, every teaching that you ever sit through, at the end of every Bible study that you ever have, you need to act on it. Act is an acronym. Apply. God, this word that I heard today, how do I apply it to my life? Change. What do I need to change to make it happen? Now, who can I teach it to? That's called making disciples. Take the word today. Don't be a hearer only. Act on it. Apply, change, teach. There's some things in my life that have to change just so that I can love God. There's some things that I have to stop doing. There's some things I have to start doing just to love God. Amen? Father God, thank you so much for your word today. Lord, I thank you that in spite of us and in spite of everything that goes on, you show yourself faithful. So, Lord, help us to learn to just sit at your feet, to choose the greater. Lord, as we all come into our life, we all come to these Mary Martha times where we have to decide whether to be busy or whether to sit at your feet. And, Lord, even then you said, listen, sitting at my feet is the greater, is the better. So, Lord, help us just to relax and to sit at your feet. In Jesus' name. If you're there today or watching online and and you have not experienced this first love, you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, let me introduce you to him. 
You see, the Word in John tells us that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That Word is Jesus. So any area of your life, anything that's going on in your life today, if we just apply the Word to it, and it's real simple. It's just a simple little prayer. It says, Jesus, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I believe that you died, were buried, and rose again. I ask you to come into my life. Be the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that with me today, if you'll just drop me a message and let me know, or if you're here today and prayed it, let, let's get started. Let's get started to fall in love with your new best friend. We'll help you do that. So contact me and let me know. I love you guys. I appreciate you. Thank you guys for coming out today. If there's anything that you need prayer for today before you leave, Meet me here at the altar, and uh, we'll, we'll lay hands on you. Amen. God bless you. Love you. Have a great week.